Hello and welcome to Virtual Investor Conferences. My name is Tim Regan and on behalf of Water Tower Research, we're very pleased you have joined us for our AI and Technology Hybrid Investor Conference. Our next live presentation comes from Sinjin Inc. Please note that you can submit all questions to the presenter in the box to the left of the slides. You can also view the company's availability for one-on-one -on -one meetings through the Scheduled Meetings tab found on the conference platform. At this point, I'm very pleased to welcome Ben Landon, VP of Business Development of, of Sinjin Inc which trades on the NASDAQ under the symbol CYN. Welcome, Ben. Thank you, Ted. All right, let's jump in here. Uh, we'll go through, and there's not much to say here on the, the cautionary statements, and let's, so let's get to talking about the company. So AI is the theme here, and that is very much in, in the heart of what we do. So if you look at some of the big macro shifts in AI lately, it's really that AI is changing the way that people work. In some cases, that is more of office type of work, like we see with some of the new solutions from OpenAI and ChatGPT. And for us at Syngin, our AI contributes to how people get work done in the physical world, in production, manufacturing, in moving things around, in building new products. And we'll dig into how we, we augment that type of work. So what we do, there's a lot of words here, but the, the, the really simplified version of this is that we are like Tesla autopilot for work vehicles. So we very much are a software company. We have a very capable hardware team and you don't really get to do anything in robotics without hardware. So we, we design hardware systems that our partners build so that our autonomous and AI software can make these vehicles run without a person needing to sit on them. And the reason that we do that is because it addresses some very big pain points for the industry that have been prevalent for years and that have frankly gotten worse over the last few years. So when the world first started automating you know, industrial automation, go back a couple of decades, it was primarily the cost of labor that people were focusing on. And in the last few years, especially with the pandemic, the shift has gone to the labor shortage. This has gotten to be not an incremental opportunity for improvement like with the cost of labor, but it's actually an existential threat to, to companies that have business, oftentimes growing business that simply cannot get enough people in the jobs or to show up for work to keep up with the requirements of the business. And finally, accidents. This is one of those just like accidents on the road stays pretty consistent as some percentage of the amount of work that you're doing, primarily driven by human error, people falling asleep, people trying to do things too fast, people not paying attention, people working long hours and, and not focusing when they're doing something that's dangerous, and just the nature of these jobs. You're, you're working around heavy vehicles that are moving a lot of weight. And that's you know, not just the, the monetary cost that we, that we want to improve the impact there, but you know, I, we really do want to live in a world where people don't need to be concerned about getting injured or worse uh, when they go in to make their living. So when you combine all of those, there's really a massive opportunity in terms of the, the cost savings that uh, augmenting the type of work that we do with technology can provide to the industry. So when you look at that opportunity and look at the types of vehicles that are out there in the world that we focus on, which includes forklifts, tow tractors, all these vehicles that are moving goods and things around manufacturing and logistics facilities on a daily basis, it's a substantial opportunity. There are millions of these vehicles out there based on the wages that people are compensated to sit on these vehicles. That's kind of how we form the pie of what there is for us to go after. So based on the volume of vehicles and how much it costs uh, to make these vehicles run and do the work that they, that they need to do because they're moving things that humans can't, right? We're talking about thousands of pounds of towing and driving, which is faster than walking. So these vehicles are needed. And the paradigm has been that they can't do the work without a person sitting on them until just recently. And what that all amounts to is that there's a pretty big pie of opportunity for us here. So we're talking, uh, based on, on our latest calculations, we're talking over $268 billion in terms of the, the solutions that we could offer into the market based on the type of work that's being done with these vehicles out there today. And 
now let's start to talk a little bit more about our specific domain of these work vehicles of why we've focused where we've focused. Uh, so I actually personally come from automotive autonomous vehicles. Uh, Tesla acquired my last company. And after that, I decided to get into the space of more of the industrial work vehicle environment. And the reason for that is some of these little thumbnails down here. And it's why we've seen the delays that have occurred with some of the big names out there that are spending a billion dollars a year trying to get autonomous robo taxis out on the roads. The reason it's taking them longer than expected, even though they are producing amazing technology and doing some incredible things, is because of the complexity of the problem that they're trying to solve. So if you look at the work that we are focusing on doing, which is moving materials at manufacturing sites on assembly lines, you know, finished goods, getting them to staging so that products can get shipped out the door. We're dealing with less complex routes, tend to do the same type of driving or same few drives over and over and over again throughout the day. The speed requirements are lower, which reduces the burden of our hardware costs. We don't need to see 200 meters out because we need to be able to stop a, a semi truck that's going 70 miles per hour on the highway. The, the regulatory hurdles are lower. We don't have to deal with NHTSA and the DMV. We deal with our customer. Our customer is essentially the governor of their own site. Uh, the workflows are predictable and common from site to site. So, you know, San Francisco is very different driving from New York, let alone from New Delhi or from Milan. But if we have a customer that manufactures engine parts in North America, it's probably pretty similar to how they manufacture engine parts in Europe. Uh, so there's there's another advantage there in terms of scalability, and that's why we focus on on this area of bringing automation into this work vehicle environment. And that sets up so what is the actual product? We call our product suite the enterprise autonomy suite, which is kind of the umbrella term that captures everything that we offer. So if we break that down, we have drive mod, which is that's the, the fancy, the robotics, the AI that goes onto the vehicles that lets them drive themselves uh, in the way that humans would. So we, we don't require infrastructure. We don't need magnetic tape. We don't need fiducials or, in other words, beacons that our vehicles can localize off of to know where they are. Uh, th this, this really is very advanced technology in terms of uh, the vehicles have the intelligence that they need in them so that they can navigate a site autonomously without human intervention. Uh, but some human intervention is required because in the end of the day, it is people who are managing these sites and people who know what type of work needs to get done. So some of that is automated through software systems talking to one another, but Syngin Insight is our customer's window to this fancy, complicated autonomous driving technology. So all they need to know is that they have a vehicle that will drive itself and Syngin Insight is their kind of their iOS feel type of environment where they can see what all the vehicles are doing, give them missions, look at analytics, look at diagnostics in real time on the vehicle. Uh, in many cases, they can remote control those vehicles uh, based on, on the application if that's a need. And then the other side of that, really that's the data side of things. The data side of the coin for us, for Syngin, is what we call Syngin Evolve, which again, to use the Tesla example, is our sensors that are on these vehicles doing work day in and day out at customer sites. We can use that data that we get in the field to then train additional AI models to simulate new driving scenarios and to essentially make our products get better and better every single day that it's being used. Now, the product is, uh, we, again, as I mentioned, we are more of a software company. That's our core competency. Uh, we do have a very capable hardware team, but in the end of the day, we are looking to sell the software that people license as a service that lets their vehicles drive themselves autonomously and produce for them the data that they have not gotten before about their operation by nature of these vehicles are now loaded with sensors. And you can see and see and learn a lot of things that you couldn't when your human workforce was driving vehicles all over the site and you had no visibility really into what those vehicles were doing. Uh, so, so our pricing is based on paid subscriptions for that software license and the a nice 
uh, silver lining to the way that we've approached the technology is you can still jump on the vehicles that we've made autonomous and operate them manually. So there's, there's really a lot of flexibility here in terms of the customer getting a vehicle that they know they can use, that they know can get the work done for them, whether it's by using the automated services or by you know, falling back to, hey, I just need to do something manually the way that I used to because something unique came up and they can still go handle that. Uh, so it's, it's not a sticking point uh, that customers would stumble on. So now let's go through what some of those vehicles are. So kind of the, the applications or the products that sit on top of this EAS and AI platform. So the, the vehicle that we are, is, is available now that we're currently selling to customers is the DriveMod Tugger. So again, DriveMod being our branded term for the AI and robotics solution that Syngin provides for vehicles. So you're looking at it here. This is a vehicle, the, the orange parts are produced by our OEM partner, Motrek. They've been building these vehicles for decades and selling them to customers. And we add the, the black and, and shiny parts that allow the vehicle to operate autonomously. So we've, uh, we've made some, some recent announcements. We've, uh, we've had deployments with, uh, with Rivian, with Polaris, with another Fortune 100 company that we are working on uh, being able to release the logo there. Uh, it's often a long process uh, given the, the competitive advantage that's gained by introducing these vehicles to our customers. So it, it often takes us some time to get the customer comfortable enough to say, all right, I'm ready to tell the world that I'm adopting this new technology because they don't want to give away that competitive edge. But this, uh, this is a vehicle that's currently capable of towing 6,000 pounds. Uh, there's a controller update that's coming from Motrek that will take it to 12,000 pounds, which just means there's more and more market for us to cover uh, with the same vehicle. Uh, so this is really finding its sweet spot in uh, manufacturing where heavy goods are being built and built day in and day out in more of an assembly line fashion. Uh, so automotive manufacturing, uh, heavy equipment manufacturing, which also includes the defense industry, agriculture, is where uh, we've seen that this vehicle has really got its sweet spot. The other vehicle that we've worked on and have shared quite a bit about is the drive mod forklift. So this is not commercially available at this moment. We have shown some early footage of the prototyping work that we've done, and we had a paid project with the global uh, leader, one of the leaders in uh, as a wood, wood supplies company, which is a Rauco. Uh, we worked in collaboration with them to develop this drive mod forklift that can lift 10,000 pounds, bit move big, heavy wooden bundles. We have videos on YouTube that I would encourage you to go see. And this one is, is really exciting. Uh, it result, the work that we did resulted in uh, that we have on the books now with Araco that is a substantial piece of revenue. It's less than 10% of the forklift fleet that they have, and their pre-order represents uh, up to you know, on the order of $5 million of annual recurring revenues once we deploy those forklifts. So that is uh, the next vehicle that we are working towards. And we're aiming to start those deliveries in uh, later this year to, to start deploying these with Araco and then expand beyond to other customers that uh, have this, you know, have a similar use case. This is a very underserved niche in terms of forklifts that can live, lift this type of heavy load autonomously. So very exciting. Uh, it does differ from the Tugger in that forklifts can do soup to nuts, pick something up, take it all the way to where it needs to go. So it's that additional next level of value creation that comes from automation. Uh, so really forklifts are kind of the holy grail of this material handling space. We're very excited to be working on them. Just borrowing from, uh, to, to drive home the point of how valuable this is, not just with the big numbers, but in some of our own experience as well. We've got case studies with customers that we've deployed with in the past. And the bottom line here is uh, moving material autonomously, whether you had people moving it before, uh, where you gain efficiency in your throughput because the vehicles can drive faster, the, the vehicles driving themselves enables people to get freed up to go do other work. Uh, that's where you see the 33% efficiency increase when you compare to a person moving uh, manually with a pallet jack. And we, we see quite a bit of customers using forklifts where they really don't need forklifts because it's the natural place to fall back into, which is I need to move something from on the ground over here to on the ground over there. 
And when we do an apples to apples comparison there, uh, that's using a very expensive machine with very expensive labor to do uh, less than that solution was designed for. So that's where we can see some pretty significant cost savings by getting customers to adopt autonomous tuggers and just reduce their cost burden for moving goods around. What is unique about us is what we call kind of the compound value of EAS uh, adoption, which, which really stems from us being as software centric of a solution as, as we are. So we are vehicle agnostic. All of our vehicles use the same maps. They show up in the same fleet management system. So as we add more and more of these vehicles to our product portfolio, we'll be in a unique position where once we engage on a first vehicle for a customer, it's very rare that a customer, especially large enterprises, only use one type of vehicle. They tend to use many, many different types. And you know, from my experience, it's not, it's not the solution, the future that everybody is looking for, that for every type of vehicle that they use, they need a different automation vendor. So the way that we approach the market is that we are putting ourselves in the position to be that multi-vehicle automation an autonomous vehicle provider. So uh, you can see here from, from the images, uh, drives home the concept that not only can we grow within a facility by getting them as many vehicles as they need uh, of a certain type within that facility, then similarly growing across a customer's facilities, but we can also grow with the types of vehicles that we can provide. So it's an additional dimension of growth and it creates this defensible moat where if we've done one or two or three vehicles for a customer and they don't need to be retrained and they can use the same uh, data repositories that are shared across all the vehicles it's very unlikely that they're going to go to another automation provider to get their fourth vehicle instead of just doing that fourth one with this engine as well this is these are some of our partners so our our very valued partners are are no doubt our uh, our oem partners because we don't intend to build the vehicles ourselves so uh, having these companies that have been building vehicles providing service and maintenance to their customers for decades goes a very long way for us uh, we also we use the latest and greatest technology that is used in the robo taxi and ai world so that's why you see names down there like ouster nvidia qualcomm uh, we work with them in, in various different capacities to use the latest and greatest sensors uh, to benefit from the, the pricing reductions that a, a very high volume industry like automotive drives on some of these components. And we use, we, we use off the shelf solutions from them so that uh, we can reap those, those hardware cost benefits and availability benefits. And we work closely with these leading technology partners as well. This is just, uh, I'll do, very quick here to say we're very proud of the team that we've built there's a lot of experience in running private companies public companies uh, there's a whole lot of robotics experience especially from the likes of uh, that middle row there where you see chris sean felix these are folks who were at companies like braincore and seagrid who have scaled robotics uh, much like the process that we're in today and uh, very so very proud of, of the leadership team and the board that we have built and so when we sum that up in, into what our competitive advantages really are, I've touched on these, it's that this advanced autonomy capability, not requiring magnetic tape and infrastructure overhaul, creating that robo taxi level of performance or human like driving that comes from being an AI centric you know, Silicon Valley company uh, that is using the latest and greatest technology from the likes of Nvidia and Auster and the best sensors and the best processors. That multiple applications piece, which I mentioned, allows us to grow our, our available market as well as to set up these defensible moats once we are in with customers uh, so that they adopt additional vehicles from us as we expand our vehicle portfolio. And the element that we are the software company, and we're very clear about that, which means we get to lean on uh, these great great companies that have been doing hardware for a long time and do it very well. We've got a few listed there, BYD, Columbia, Motrek. We've partnered with them on various different vehicles. And that really sets up a very symbiotic relationship where they focus on what they're good at with hardware. Uh, we don't need to rebuild those channels. We focus what, on what we're good at with software and everybody kind of gets better together as opposed to creating a competitive environment uh, with incumbents. 
and we're focused on material handling today. You see those those vehicles on the left, the stock chasers, the tuggers. We we want to carve out success there before we we think about expansion. But we already have forklift opportunities. Uh, we're very familiar with and have been in touch with companies in different domains that we know could benefit from this technology and we've built it in a way that we can scale across you know to to our technology it doesn't matter matter when whether we're at a manufacturing site or an airport or a mine in the end of the day the technology is built to be uh, transferable across the, those domains with with some adjustments of course uh, but we we do see a future where we can continue to expand that available market that we have and, and really grow to, to something to something massive. Uh, but first and foremost, we, we are focusing on carving out that success in the material handling space. Uh, so with that, I will say thank you, wrap it up. You see there uh, the name of, of our CFO, Don Alvarez, uh, who also is in charge of our investor relations. So I invite you to, to reach out to Don or myself. I'm easy to remember, ben at sinjin.com or to go visit our website where we have our investor materials and uh, contact, uh, contact channels as well. So with that, let me go and address some of the questions that have come in. Uh, so there is a, a question here that, that I think is, is very pertinent, which is, when do you plan to expand deployments with current customers? Does this usually take three to six months? So this is a great question. It's certainly in at at the focus of where we are now because we've we've had these first wins with some really great logos that we know have a substantial breadth of business and a substantial need. Uh, this is a new technology. Uh, we are working with industrial customers, so uh, certainly it's a sales cycle that we count on the order of months. We do see a, a typical a typical ramp up profile of uh, since it is a new technology it is safety critical customers are a little bit careful in the beginning they want to see that it works on their site uh, then they make a first purchase they use that uh, they they put that first purchase to use for for a small period but in in that time we're already warming them up to well how many of these vehicles will you need if we you know we're very confident in what our technology can do how many vehicles will you need once you've seen what you need to from this initial purchase how many do you need at this facility what about your your sister facilities can we start talking to people there so that sets up these kind of three stages that we call the the pilot purchase the fleet purchase, which is expansion with that first customer, and then the enterprise level expansion, which is many vehicles across many sets. So uh, we're, we're right at the heart of trying to, you know, we accelerate that as much as we can. But uh, again, industrial sales, sales cycles, new technology uh, that is safety critical. So we, we, have to, we have to put in the work. We have, to, we have our customer success team showing customers their return on investment and doing that through the various data dashboards that we have but we, we do generally expect those ramp ups to occur over uh, periods of months. Does announcing the deployment of your technology with a particular company imply the possibility of a purchase order? Yeah, th there's a few questions revolving around this and, and revenue projections. So we have not been giving revenue guidance. Uh, what we what we do announce in the, the public domain, since we are, you know, we want to give you the best news that we can, uh, but we also have to be respectful of the fact that we are mentioning brands that are not our own, and and that we we only you know, we need we need to get the agreement of you know what we can and can't say about what our customers are doing. Uh, so so when a, you know we we will we're very deliberate with the words that we use. Uh, we share what we can share, and so I would just, uh, you know, I would invite you to to stay tuned. If we are going as far as to drop the the logo of a brand, it means that there's something real there. It means that they've uh, they've approved us telling the world that we're working together. And when we uh, when we do start, uh, we'll obviously be reporting from quarter to quarter on on the revenues. And when we do start giving the revenue guidance, you know, very rarely. Uh, is any customer okay with you telling the world how much business you do with them? That's very confidential information, uh, but we, we will try to give you the best information that we can share with you uh, according to you know, what's, what's in our, our 
our ability and the, the diligence that we and protection that we provide to our customers from a confidentiality nature. Uh, there is a question on uh, what can we expect from initial deployments, basically how much of the contract are you getting when. So this actually, this, this is much easier to speak to now that we're, uh, the, the pricing model that, that we are using is, uh, is pretty set and, and is moving forward. We, uh, our standard pricing includes selling a vehicle and uh, having that vehicle include a three-year prepaid license for EAS. So once we've done an initial deployment and are, you know, if we're, and, and are moving towards a production deployment, uh, initial deployments are often, you know, that's, that's oftentimes not yet a purchase. That's the, that's what I mentioned that it's the onsite proof uh, that has some uh, small revenues attached to it, but not in, not necessarily as, as a purchase. They're more of a covering the cost of showing the, the proof uh, of the system working. And we do, uh, we do in some cases, uh, take those on to as more of a promotional effort, knowing the opportunity that exists uh, for doing that successfully and making the sale. And so that's usually something that we just do over a few days, uh, just like if you were buying a new CRM solution the your uh, your your sales vendor would uh, would show you an online demo. We don't have the the uh, the luxury of of showing robots uh, working without showing up and doing a little bit more work. But we can turn around uh, an on-site demo in a few days, which then opens up the discussion of what is the purchase that's going to be made, which introduces the uh, sale of a vehicle with a three-year prepaid license. Which uh, at our at our standard price is a you know, six figure sale per vehicle. Uh, so that, uh, but we are collecting in the standard model those revenues up front, which, as I said, you'll see in the in the numbers that we that we ultimately report out. Uh, there's a question about clarification of stock chasers and tuggers. This this is a yeah, this is a good point of clarification. So uh, really stock chasers and tuggers, these are, you know, tugger is actually a, they're both generic terms for vehicles that have a slightly different form factor. They do more or less the same type of work. Uh, they, they tow thousands of pounds. Uh, so we're actually doing for, to try to make this a little bit easier to understand, we're actually, uh, we're bundling those under the term of tugger since they, they both tug and then it's, you know, it's less of a focus on is a stock chaser being purchased, is a tow tractor from Motrek being purchased. Uh, that is not what I would necessarily focus on. They're, you know, they're, they, they are similar solutions that do a similar thing. The, the autonomy service that we provide in the end of the day is you know, what's, what's important to, to us. Uh, so in many cases, we actually, based on the availability of the vehicles that we have in our demo fleet, will actually show up to a customer, uh, demonstrate to them that a stock chaser works, for example, and then they might end up buying a tugger from Motrek uh, for you know, whatever, whatever reasons work for them, whether it's they, they know Motrek as a brand or uh, there is a slightly different you know, need that uh, the nuances and differences of those vehicles apply. But all in all, I, I would just, you know, I'd, I think you can bundle those terms together where tugger is more of the use case, the application, and the physical metal that is sold uh, that that customer uses doesn't really change the solution that we provide to them. The pricing is similar. The end solution is similar. Uh, so don't get too hung up on uh, the, the pieces of the, of the solution that are interchangeable, which is the, you know, the hardware component that is the platform to our technology doing the work that it needs to do. I'm just looking through the questions here. I think we'll just have time for one more. Uh, there, there's a, there was a question on uh, how many have how many uh, other or existing clients have shown interest in forklifts. You heard me say it before. Forklifts really are the the holy grail of material handling. So we, in our lead generation, in our inbound for marketing, there is a significant 
and, and very strong signal for forklifts. Uh, it's why we are now, as we've released the Tugger solution uh, commercially and are starting to sell that, we're, we're going to focus on shifting a lot of our R&D efforts to now doing the same and commercializing and releasing the forklift to production uh, because there's, there's without a doubt, I mean, this is before autonomy was part of the equation, more forklifts are sold than tow tractors, tuggers, stock chasers, those types of vehicles. It's, it's a, a vehicle that does, uh, that can do more work, uh, can do more types of work, is more expensive, is more dangerous. So all of those, you know, those three pillars of value that I focused on are just amplified for the forklift. And we definitely see that in the customer demand that we get. And so now for us, it's a when can we be ready with that solution uh, with a Rocco being the spearhead that drives it forward and how quickly can we release that autonomous forklift solution uh, to, to take our growth to, to the next level. And with that, I think we are up on time. So I will, I'll pause there uh, to make sure I don't eat up uh, other, other conferences.